This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, I am David Yoon, the um, uh, Associate Curator of uh, Medieval, Renaissance, and Early Modern um, European Coins at the ANS, and I am pleased um, to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, David Barakashvili um, studied at the University of uh, at Tbilisi State University in Georgia, where he um, did his PhD on um, um, the uh, um, early and middle Bronze Age settlements and um, graves in Western Georgia, and he is um, now um, a professor at the University of Georgia, the one in Tbilisi, not the one um, in the United States. Um, and he continues to carry out active research on um, medieval as well as Bronze Age topics, um, a variety of different topics um, uh, in the Republic of Georgia and um, nearby countries. Um, uh, in particular, he is the director of the Samsvilda Archaeological Project, and tonight he will be talking to you about his um, research at this very important uh, medieval site, and in particular about um, the um, a substantial 13th century coin hoard found at the site of Samsvilda. So here it is, David Barakashvili. Thank you very much. Before, before I start talking about archaeology and about the main part of the presentation, I want to take a few minutes and to make a short introduction. First of all, I want to say my express my gratitude to the American Numismatic Society uh, that it gave me the stage here and I can share my uh, research or my the results of my research here. And I want to express my gratitude to the director of this society, Dr. Jill Bransburg my gratitude to Emma Prate, who um, I was working about a few minutes ago and making the photographing of the Georgian coins we found here. And I also want to express my gratitude to Austin, who was in the process of the organizing today's event. So uh, <clears throat> this was what I wanted to say. And of course, to David Yoon, whom I met two months ago, and uh, I emailed him to ask meeting and talking about Georgian coins, and he um, invited me here, and this is how all this started. So I'm very thankful to all of you. <clears throat> I also want to uh, make a, a small to send a small note, note to all of you that in my presentation, I have a, about 30 slides and some of them make a general overview of the Georgian landscape and Georgian cultural heritage, because I think this is the best way to start talking about the archaeological cultures or some particular coins with the overview of the general, general background. And also want to say that there are some slides that represent a, that represent a medieval graves with the human remains scene. So we have some human remain remain photos also in our presentation to take as a note. And uh, the last part, uh, definitely, I want to say that. It was not easy for me to prepare today's presentation because I am not a native English speaker. So my skills in English language is not very sophisticated. And also I'm very limited, not very, but a bit limited in my vocabulary. And uh, if there is, there will be something blur or not clearly understanding during the presentation, later on the question answer slot, I will try to expand it and to explain in the best way, better way. Okay, now I want to start this uh, presentation with the first slide, with the first slide that makes a sense about the country of Georgia, which is a small land in the South Caucasus, but in terms of nature 
and uh, cultural diversity is very beautiful, very attractive. It is uh, washed by the Black Sea waters from the west side and borders present day Turkey. From the northern, northern side, it's surrounded by the uh, permanent glaciers and the high mountain system, Caucasian mountain system, which is very, very attractive for the for the tourists, particularly in the winter time and in the summer time as well. Uh, also, there are a very photogenic and very spectacular valleys, gorges in the plains of the country, and uh, several hundred rivers and uh, lots of interesting. Uh, touristic destinations and in particular southern part of the country there is a unique uh, unique outcrop of the clay and of the different metals and this part was particularly important and attractive for the people who lived here in the prehistoric times or even in the prehistoric times they could have access to the clay to the metal so this part, the middle and the southern part of the country is very rich in archaeology, in archaeological sites, in terms of archaeological sites. So like the landscape and the nature, also cultural heritage is very rich and very various, various in Georgia. So after the excavations, we have here the sites starting from the uh, Paleolithic times up to the 18th, 19th centuries. And the different artifacts we have from this site help us to understand what was the level, let's say, of goldsmiths in the classical period, like this, uh, like this golden head, headdress makes a sense to have an idea about the 5th, 6th, 5th centuries BC, what a goldsmith level uh, they had. Also, this necklace of the second millennia BC, second millennia BC for the Georgian historiography and is a middle, middle bronze period. So in the middle bronze period also, it was very high level of the goldsmiths and the <coughs> metallurgy. This golden goblet also is attributed to the middle bronze age incustrated by uh, precious and semi-precious stones and comes from the burial mount of Trialeti, which is also the southern part of the country. And, uh, and this iconic golden lion, also the bronze period, which is kind of a symbol of the power and the goldsmiths at the same time, and very is kind of a brand for the Georgian cultural heritage. So we could talk here about this kind of uh, artifacts endlessly, but we cannot continue. But when we are talking about the cultural heritage, I guess the Georgian food and the Georgian kitchen also is a part of the cultural heritage. Because one can find a kind of a dishes here, which is not very common, not in Europe, not in the United States, and you can get it particularly in Georgia. So I consider, not I, it's considered Georgian food, also kind of a cultural heritage, and of course, wine. Recently, there was excavations. There was excavations by Georgian and the Canadian archaeology, archaeological team, and they excavated the settlement of the 6 millennia BC. The date of the settlement was 6 millennia BC, and they discovered the remains of the grapes and after the palynological studies, the results said that these grapes already were used for production of the wine in the 6th millennia BC. So now we are tend to say that Georgia is maybe not number one or maybe number two. It's a discussion, still discussion between Georgian and Armenian colleagues who, who did the first wine. But we have such a result and we say that in Georgia, they produced a very, very old wine. And sometimes it goes to the cover of the National Geographical Science and so on, so on. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, here we have a map of the, of the small land 
what I already described, and it borders Black Sea, Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan from the south, and Russian, huge Russian Federation from the north. And because of the cultural and natural diversities and also the uh, very um, important location at the crossroad of Europe and Asia, the different people, different, different societies, different empires uh, crossed this land during the centuries and millennia. So it was, it was Greeks who appeared here in the period of a Greek colonization, which is seventh, sixth centuries for Georgian historiography. Uh, also Romans were very actively entering the particularly western part of the country. And there are uh, lots of Roman numismatic courts and single numismatic uh, artifacts, coins kept in the Georgian National Museum. There are about a few hundred, as far as now, as I know, the Roman, the Greek coins. Um, of course, it was very strong influence from the southern and southeastern regions like Achaemenians, uh, Achaemenian Empire, and uh, Sasanian Empire. And this, this was particularly very strong in the six, fifth, sixth centuries AD, Sasanian influence, and uh, there are uh, lots of Sasanian coins still we have, we do have in the museums and in the private collections as well. Uh, later on, Arabians appeared here with their uh, coins and with their uh, um, influence on the local culture. Later, there was uh, Salchuk's with their coins and with their cultural influence, Mongols and Ottomans, and later at 18th, 19th centuries, Russians appear and also brought uh, lots of Russian coins and the Russian numismatic courts and the Russian Bolsheviks. And finally, we have the Russian Federation still trying to make the country under the Russian umbrella, so we tend to say. So I did all this excursion because it helps us to understand how complicated and how diverse is the cultural heritage of the country, because on one hand, it has a local traditional roots, and on the other hand, it had overlapped many, many times by this uh, by these uh, cultural so representatives of different cultures. Now I want to shift closer to main part of my presentation to one particular archaeological site, Samshulde, which is the main topic for our job today and a point that part, uh, that, that point which is the location of Samshulde site close to Tbilisi which is the capital, which is the modern capital of the country today, and uh, close also to Mtscheta, which was the medieval, medieval capital of the country, very spectacular and very historical city. So once you or once uh, ever who visits Georgia, definitely goes to Mtscheta, Tbilisi, but Samshulde is less known. Samshulde is less known. Uh, personally, I don't have explanation why Samshulde was out of the scientific radars. Uh, probably the reason was a big scale of the site. And in the Soviet times and in post-Soviet times, no one dared to start a big scale excavations of the site. And it was until the, until the, <clears throat> recently when the University of Georgia started first excavations uh, and sent a team of the archaeologists. But some Shulde site had very, very, very affordable location on, the, uh, on this point, which is the northwest part of this very complicated economical, political and cultural route of the medieval centuries, which we often call a Silk Road. So if we take a close look, we see that 
it was located, the site was located, the city was located here on this part of this network, which led from the Oriental world, from the Iranian world to the Black Sea shores. And then from this point where today there is a Batumi or Poti, also the important archeological sites and today they represent the ports. The maritime routes started towards the Constantinople. So it had a very affordable location here. But not only, but this location was not good for only economical or political reasons, but also for the geographical, in terms of geography, because it had naturally, it was a naturally fortified promontory which is quite a big, which has a quite a big scale. So if you take a point B at the very tip of the site and take a measure to the point, point A and point B over here, it is more than two and a half kilometer. So a huge archaeological complex. And that's, that's what I mean when I said maybe it was the reason big scale, no archaeological team, so no one started big scale studies, excavations here, never before the University of Georgia. And the site, as far as we know for today's site, uh, is not archaeological site, is not only this surface of the promontory, but also it is also spread to this, uh, to this uh, gorges and to these valleys of the River Hrami, which comes, which starts and continues here, and the gorges of uh, River Chivjava. There are um, archaeological, there are um, caves that combine uh, archaeological context and archaeological layers, and they are attributed to the prehistorical times, medieval times, and the late medieval times. And now we think that, now we we understand that the Samshulde site, which at the beginning was considered only this part, has a wider scale. So this whole area is a national uh, archaeological complex of Samshulde. And, and our excavations, which we started in 2012, of course, we cannot take this big scale. Our excavations, which we started, was on the on the eastern part of the city, which is the eastern tip, and in the middle part of the city. So from the medieval times, it was divided into three parts, this city. The western part, which is often called, and which is regarded as a part for a merchants or a farmers and were used or resided by ordinary people, by general population, and the middle part, which is called nobles part. Here we have remains of the medieval palaces and medieval churches and the hydrological network also is well presented here and the royal part, royal part, which was the best defended, which was the best defended, defensed. So we started excavations over here where we have a ruins of the of the 8th century cathedral, 8th century cathedral of Sioni. So when we are talking about the cathedral, it means that this area was very important because not, every, not everywhere we have, you know, cathedrals. We have a lots of Christian churches or a different kind of a, uh, spiritual buildings, but the cathedral in this area surroundings only we have we do have here and one area one archaeological area we opened here and on the second second field season we got a very good coins very good <coughs> numismatic uh, numismatics okay now let's have a close close look to this Sioni ruins cathedral ruins and unfortunately today it's it is in such a condition, such a condition, and the government tries to make projects, different pro, pro, projects of conservation or rehabilitation, 
but in fact, no, no, some <coughs> something really happens yet. And to the to the northern side of this um, historical building, we put this archaeological trench, and the next one closer to it. And also we excavated here one trench, which here on this picture, on this photo already filled with the soil and the covered. And now let's see how this archaeological trenches looks like. I also want to say a few words about this particular building, Samshul de Sioni Cathedral. It has a, uh, it still has a uh, old Georgian inscription which is the middle of the 8th century, one of the oldest inscription. Uh, and inscription we can see here is only a fragment, is only a part of that original one. Originally, it was about a 35 meter length, which could be considered as a, the longest, long, longest inscription in the Southern Caucasus medieval epigraphic, among the medieval epigraphics. And it says, it mentions the names of the Byzantinian emperors, Constantine V, Copronim, and his son Leon IV the Hazar. Also, there we have the names of the Varas Bakur and Yuan, who were the Georgian nobles. So this inscription, I just bring this inscription here in my presentation to underline, to make bold the importance of this cathedral. So in terms of architectural or epigraphic, this is the very unique, very unique monument. Okay, now let's go back to archaeology and I will look on these trenches and on these trenches I already mentioned. So we opened trench N7, N8, O7, O8 and in O8 we got a uh, we got an uh, uh, individual graves uh, and these trenches uh, and graves and the trenches gave us the different archaeological materials that represented that was represented by uh, glass uh, bracelets. Sometimes they were very colorful, very high quality glass was used to produce such a kind of uh, jewelry. And of course, the pottery, uh, mostly the pottery is the local production, but in some part we have also the imported one. Metal objects we have here represented by uh, needles, arrowheads, some decorations, and sometimes we don't even understand what kind of, what does the metal objects mean. And of course, coins. First coins appeared right on this place and it was a few of them from the beginning but later when we started excavation these graves uh, then they appeared in a bigger bigger scale in a more amount so this is the trench 08 and the base and the floor of this trench is represented by basalt basalt and this this basalt bedrock these graves these pits for the graves were, were prepared and in these graves the individual persons were buried and in this particular case which is regarded as a grave number four number uh, number four grave number four we had one individual uh, the female individual uh, who had a kind of a disease as our bioarchaeologist says she couldn't, she had uh, problems with the uh, hips, so she couldn't walk during the, her life. But anyway, uh, she had uh, she had uh, potteries, potteries in the grave, which were later reconstructed and we couldn't identify the typology of this pottery. And the pottery goes to the 12th, 13th centuries. And also she had a numismatic, small numismatic hoard on some place. I will show you now. So it was excavated by Georgian and Canadian students. We were running the archaeological field school in those times. And it was very funny for the students. 
uh, having excavations during the day and then relaxing the evening time, having uh, water, sometimes wine and analyzing of the whole day and studying and working. And it was really very good experience for them. But I remember one funny story when first I saw first these coins over here between the between the arms and between the rims that that student the jane couldn't couldn't see the the coins there so she was cleaning the grave for two days you know and then when she started taking up out the bones i said jane why you're missing the coins why you don't pay attention she said where are the coins i don't see here the coins and i said how you couldn't see the coins for two days and then she said, Mr. David, I am a bioarchaeologist and I'm focusing on the bones and on the teeth. And, <laughs> and so I said, no, the bones are good, everything good, but don't miss, please, this, <clears throat> these objects. And then, of course, we got it and sent them to the, to the lab of the National, Georgian National Museum, where they were uh cleaned uh, from rust and uh, we got this kind of image even before cleaning them we had an idea that these coins were very impressive very important because even under the rust it was the image of the king but later we realized that it was not the image of the king it was the image of a jesus christ and had an inscription around of this image and also on the reverse there was a ins inscriptions and after the cleaning we got this this art this material this material so they represent them they represent a, a silver dirhams of the queen rusudan Queen Rusudan is the representative of the Georgian royal family of Bagrationi, and she was the uh, only king, only queen uh, who made um, minting the coins of silver. Before her and after her, all the medieval coins, mostly of the medieval coins, were struck by the copper. So this is very short chronological frame when the Georgian royal family representative started minting of the uh, coins uh, by silver. Okay, let's say a few words. Let's take a close look and let's say a few words what we got here. So we have here the Jesus Christ. And by the way, when we were working on the numismatic collections you have here in the society, you have two of these coins here. In your uh, in your collections, where Emma and me were today photographing. So this is also a very good result of the of our collaborations. That at least you know that you have two silver coins of Queen Rusudan here. Maybe there are more, but we have to see them in the next days in the future. Okay, the Jesus Christ is the center of the coin, and the Greek letters I see. X I the, the means then you know the Jesus Christ and the circular it has the inscription in all the Georgian letters all Georgian letters that we do not practice today we do the what we are practicing today is a new Georgian letters but in the coins and the medieval paleography cases mostly we have these letters inscriptions called Asum Tavruli it is it says, uh, it gives us the date for Coronicon 450. Coronicon 450 is the date according to an old Georgian calendar. That is, uh, that is uh, equal to 1230. So first half of the 13th, 13th century. On the reverse, we also have these old Georgian inscriptions, R, S, N. So the short form of the queen's name, and around it there is a uh, there is an Arabian inscription that says Queen of the Queens, 
glory of the world and face Rusudan, daughter of Tamar, champion of Messiah. So three different languages, three different letters were used on these coins. And why? Because these coins were circulating not only in the local scale, but in the international scale. If you take, we already had a look on this Silk Road. So as some shoulder was the part of the Silk Road, the coins that were struck here could go outside of the South Caucasus region. So this is the good example, good example how this city was uh, involved in this economical relationship between Eastern and the Western worlds. Okay, just I will take a cup of glass of water and continue. Okay, now let's now let's see what results we have on the second on the second archaeological area here, which is called the Citadel of Samshule, and which is about 150 meters away from Sion area. From here we had these silver coins. The Citadel of Samshulde is the huge fortification system that controls the eastern part of the city and inside of this fortification system we have uh, three different period buildings and these buildings when you when you have a look on these buildings the picture is very complicated because the buildings of the later times overlapping the buildings of the earlier times and sometimes it's quite confusing and quite complicated to excavate by but after 10 year excavations, we have idea about the chronology, about the stratigraphy of the, uh, of, of the uh, buildings, and can say that this part is represented by the remains of the 16th, 18th century's palace remains. It's still a uh, process of excavations, and we did excavations last year and this year, and we'll continue the next year also, because if you want to get the older context, first you have two excavations, you know, the upper buildings, otherwise you cannot go down. But in this part of this area of this citadel area, we were lucky to go down under the context, under the soil, and we had there the, we had there the uh, high medieval, high medieval stuff. Also, this is important to mention the Royal Bass House, which was connected to the to the Royal Palace, and they are the same date. And we suppose when this Royal Palace was functioning, also this uh, Royal Bass House was attributed to it. And here, uh, when we go deeper in archaeological uh, layers, <laughs> When we went deeper to archaeological layers, we got very interesting, very interesting buildings. The some part of these buildings were survived, some parts of the building were destroyed by the fire. Particularly interested was interesting was the trench number 16. <clears throat> so we have here 99 archaeological trenches. So we have the all the citadel we have under the archaeological grid. And according to grid, this is trench number 16, which was destroyed by a fire. And it was, of course, bad for the people who live there, but for us archaeologists, it was perfect because everything was left on the floor level. So this is how it looked like. These are the walls of the building that still spreads under the soil. And this is the interior of this uh, of this room. We call it a room. And all these ruins were represented by bricks, by roof tiles, by um, remains of the uh, wooden pillars and the roof construction. And after excavations for two years, our team, the team of our students, uh, were able to reach the floor level. First, it was 
in that corner and later on it was cleaned around and after cleaning the uh, after cleaning the all these ruins all the all this uh, collapsed material in this part we identify the wooden uh, char we had the concentration of the charcoal which was unusual and we started cleaning it very very carefully and the first coins appeared right here it was in 2018 but it was the last week of the excavations and after we got the five coins and more appeared then we decided to leave it and keep it for the next year and we really did like that and the next year so 2019 we had a big discovery good good hoard of the coins and yeah it was right on this spot <clears throat> this is 2019 when we started cleaning this area and this is how it looked like in in situ situation these coins and later on they were cleaned around and the second group also appeared here and between them and around them we also had the concentration of a charcoal and also we had here some decorative artistic metal objects that later we realized that also was connected with, with that find with that find and these artistic decoration decorated metal objects were used for decoration of that wooden box small wooden box where all these coins were kept before the fire so after the fire the wood has gone coins left on the same area on the same place and these metal objects also this, uh, also were left there and also there was a there were this log seems this uh, the cover of this wooden box was attached to the main part uh, in terms that it could close and open and also lock was used for closing the put a lock on, on. <clears throat> okay now let's see how these coins looked like when we got them from the archaeological context and in some in some moments they were uh, separated from each other like this one that one but in some cases they were joined they were corroded by rust to each to each other so needed a really a creative uh, work and the cleaning process and also we did like that in the um, uh, lab of the georgian national museum so this is how they looked like and even even at the moment of the discovery we could identify the coins of this we call them irregular shapes and also we had they are the regular shapes like uh, this one but uh, this is the whole <coughs> image the main horde of some children that represents uh, 285 coins and uh, about 99 percent of these coins are now Georgian coins we call we call the Georgian coins and mean that coins that were struck under the Georgian royal family but five percent or so we have the imported coins the inter, um, from the oriental world not Georgian uh, that were minted not, uh, under the <coughs> Georgian rulers so <coughs> Yeah, of course, I cannot talk here about 285 coins. It's not easy for me. I don't have such a deep knowledge of the medieval Georgian numismatics. But what I can do now uh, is just present a main type of the coins that were minted by King uh, George III. You also have the coin of the George III coin here in your society in your numismatic funds. So you have very good analogs here from the excavations. When you will publish your Georgian medieval coins or will uploading on the website, you can have a very good parallels from some shoulder site. 
There is also the coins of Queen Tamar, who was the daughter of the King George III. Queen Tamar's coins also very well represented in your numismatic uh, funds here. You have about a, what I calculated, about a 20 or maybe 25 coins of Queen Tamar you have here. And the third group of the King Lasha force, Georgi force Lasha, who was the son of Queen Tamar and grandson of the George III. The coins of Georgi force Lasha also you got here in your collection. <clears throat> So I will show the main types of this coin here. And there is a publication of some Schulde Hort that today, I, by the way, we donated to the library. So all these 285 coins, you can see in the book here, you will enjoy it. Okay. The Queen Tamar and her father, King George III, represented on the wall painting of Warzia Monastery of the 12th century. This is very uh, rare image of the queen and the king. Okay, the first type from this three is a coin of uh, George III. This is my favorite because this coin was very well preserved and even inscription on the reverse of it that is in Arabian is easy to read and well preserved. And on the obverse, you have a whole image of the king sitting in the oriental manner and has a falcon, falcon has a falcon on the arm, and the Georgian letters around says K -E uh, R Gir of uh, again the sh short name of the name of the king. And the Arabian inscription says, uh, King of the King, Georgi, son of Dimitri, sword of the Messiah. So this is the one of the iconic medieval Georgian coin. We call it uh, Mepe Georgi Shewardnit. This is translated into English, King George III with the falcon. So this is how it often mentioned in the, in the particular literature. Okay, the next coin is I want to show, I want to share is the coin of Queen Tamar. It is a smaller one in size, but it has a <clears throat> facsimile of the queen in the uh, floral, decorated by floral orna ornamentation, and also with the Arabic inscription on the reverse, Arabic inscription in this case said, adorer of the Messiah, not sword of the Messiah. So it seems that in the case of the male and the female king, this, uh, this inscription was a bit different. But anyway, it said glorious queen, uh, beauty of the world, and so on and so on, but adorer of the Messiah. Queen Tamar had a different kind of a coins and almost all the type of coins you, you have in your collections here. Even this one, even this one you have here in the next room. And the third type of the uh, coins is the uh, coin, copper coin of a uh, King Georgi IV Lasha. And this is the wall painting of that king and the Georgian inscription and Arabian inscription give us the date of the coin that can be used for other coins of the same, same king, minted by the same king, and the inscription also shows how it was trend, what was the trend in those times to write on the reverse. Reverse. Yeah, just one a common general slide. And here we can figure how these irregular shape coins looked like this one, that one. Sometimes they resemble kind of animals, sometimes of fish, sometimes we call them fish coins, particular this, this one. And yeah, and the publication of some Schulde Hort, which, which is accessible for you and you can search it when 
when need uh, parallels for the Georgian coins. I also want to take a minute and show one particular case of this. For me, I never seen such a case before. So when we got it from the archaeological trench, at the beginning we were thinking that there were a few coins attached to each other by rust or some dirt, but after cleaning these uh, two coins, we realized that they were attached to, to each other, not by rust, but it was some kind of a intention activities done to, to stick these two coins to each other. So outer one, that one, which is the coin of a coin of a George the third, because we can read all the inscription from outside was banned intentionally for after the physical pressure. So it is not easy to bend the copper coin, you know. I have no explanation why did they do that. Maybe you have experience or ever seen such a kind of case. I will be very thankful if you share some of your experience if you have seen such. So the one coin was bent and the second one, which is in the middle, was just put in the middle and pressed and they are so attached to each other, you can never uh, take the inner one out. They are attached to each other. I have no explanation why did they do so. So did they try to high, did they try to rise the value of these coins? Or did they try to rise weight of these coins? So this is a question. I have no idea. Very unusual. I also had a conversation with my colleagues, with the different numismat numism the people who are in numismatics, but none of them have experienced. No one knows what the, what is this representing. And the and the and the second question, second question is where were all these coins, all these copper coins minted, where the Samshulde court was minted? There is two options. First option is that this hoard, these coins were just circulating in the region and then in the wooden box was kept by a individual and then left in the room and after the fire, no one took it away. Or the second option, the coins were minted on the promontory, on the site. But we didn't yet find the mint coin mint after our excavations, but uh, the size is quite big of the city you've seen and maybe next year after the next year excavations will give more answers. But also we have some small hints that pushes us to think that here must be a here could be a royal mint on the territory of the site, because in the two cases we had we had such a copper plates that were just it seems that they were prepared to be minted as a coins but they weren't so they have a shape of those irregular coins and also the shape of the regular coins but nothing on one side and nothing on another side personally for me it's very attractive idea to think that there was something the royal mint around the citadel or inside the citadel walls but until we do not have an archaeological evidence we cannot say that for sure but also we have here one interesting one interesting slab of the copper and when i searched the literature it was very common practice to prepare the slabs before starting minting the coins. And if you look this slab, it was definitely prepared in the, uh, in the special forms in the mold, molds for different, and not different, I think they were prepared for the coin minting. So this is, uh, this is the question we do not still have an answer. 
but hope for the next next year will give more <coughs> things to talk about. Yeah, actually, this was the this was the main uh, results what I wanted to share you. Thank you very much, and we'll be happy if you have some questions and remarks. Thank you. We do have a, a mic here for questions in the room, and we also have potential questions um, from the virtual audience. So I'm going to kind of run around for the mic in person, and then we'll also take questions uh, from the virtual audience. David, yeah, thank you for this absolutely fascinating uh, lecture. Um, one thing particularly that, that really strikes me about these coins is the multilingualism of the coins, where you have a Georgian inscription on the obverse and then an Arabic inscription on the reverse. The, the Georgian inscription seems to be primarily administrative in the sense of identifying the authority and sometimes where the coin was struck, whereas the Arabic inscription seems um, to be directed towards a particular audience in the sense of um, a perhaps non-Christian audience uh, and underscoring, uh, you know, the, the Messiah, you know, a Christian Messiah, as well as, um, uh, you know, the keeper of the faith and, you know, things of that sort. So presumably, at least, you know, from my absolutely non, I, I, I know nothing about these coins, but, that there does seem to be a, a very distinctive difference in the audiences and the presentation of these inscriptions on one side yeah. or the other. And, and the Arabic, Arabic inscription, again, seems very pointedly directed towards um, what I presume would be a Muslim audience, um, you know, by underscoring the, the Christian faith of the producers of the coin and so forth which you know raises questions about audience and reception and also circulation of the coins uh, and so forth but my question is aside from these coins do you do you have any other evidence from this period of that type of messaging towards that particular um, audience in arabic language or does this appear only on the coins no only on the coins only on the coins we do not have any epigraphic or paleographic uh, monuments from the same time that can be that uh, is in Arabian language. Mainly, we do have this from the coins. And yeah, you are absolutely right when you say that this Arabian inscription was directly to those people who were the Arabian language people. Yeah. So would, would these people be traders that were moving through this area yes, then? Yes, probably uh, yes. So. Who knows? Maybe there also were the Arabian, the, the people who spoke in Arabian who resided, the Samshul, the promontory right. or surroundings. But may, mainly these kind of uh, Arabian letters, Arabian inscriptions were for the traders and for the caravans that were passing through the Samshul and going to west from uh, oriental side or other side yeah right. if, you, if you take uh, attention the georgian letters are only a few only a few georgian letters we have right. that represent a short forms of the kings or the queens just one letter r s or g i rusudan or georgi when in the arabian language case it's a whole inscriptions and the whole letters yeah yeah All right, thank you for for those who didn't know who was the king or who was the queen so this long arabian letter saying that this was king of georg george and this was the queen of rosudan sword of messiah and so on so on so for those audience who didn't know the particular name of the kings but when having such a coin with the arabian inscription they could they could use it as a international international money. Yeah. We also have a number of questions online. Um, I'm going to invite people who are online to ask their question out. And if you don't have a, a mic or don't want to ask your question out, I'm also happy to read it out. But um, Daniel Wolf, if you could ask your question.
All right, and the and the question here is: Are the coin are the hordes um, of the three rulers all in bronze? Uh, I'm assuming that's the yeah the three different um, the king the queen and the king you mentioned of, before. Uh, three rulers all bronze. The coins <laughs> the coins are of copper, copper. The bronze is different, you know, sometimes <laughs> copper and the bronze are considered the same, but uh, bronze is the alloy of a copper plus something else, right? But in this case, we have poor copper as for we did only we did uh, uh, studies of the alloy only uh, three coins and they show the results show that they are poor copper, nothing else added. So we cannot say that they are a uh, Bronze, we do say that they are a copper coins. I'll, I'll um, interject my own question here. I have one. Um, I know in you know in Greek antiquity we have literary evidence of um, sort of burying burying people with coins and sort of descriptions of that. That's also matched in some cases in the archaeological record. Um, do you have a sense from literary sources or from other archaeological context? Uh, why someone might have been buried with coins? Did it have sort of a sort of a religious implication or a deeper sort of funerary yeah. context that you speculate about? Yes, these silver coins we were talking about. Yes, they were from the graves. But this is the different tradition in the classical time of the Greeks had the coin either in the mouth or in the on the head. This is the different cultural experience. We, I don't, I have no good explanation why these 10 silver coins were placed in that grave of this female individual, because in those, in this period graves, actually it's very rare when you have a coins. And also it's very rare when you have a, some a potteries, but in this case, we also did have two potteries, so a jug and a, uh, the bowl and these 10 silver coins. But from my experience, and my experience is that 25 years of excavations, I never met such a case, uh, no other archaeological sites. The next, what, the next question we have here is from um, Bernard. Bernard, if you want to ask your question out, we should be able to hear it in the room. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes okay. we can. So uh, thank you for this uh, beautiful presentation. I was uh, wondering if there were any uh, historical records in uh, archive about the minting activity of Georgian coins, because that could give you some clues in terms of how many mints were uh, there and uh, when they were active and, and help you with your research. Yes, there are such a such a records that are kept in the National Archive of Georgia about the main mints in the medieval Georgia, and we do know so we do we do know so we do know that the main mints in Georgia were in Tbilisi, present day capital, and this we know from the records and also the excavations in Tbilisi. And another mint was in the historical city of uh, Damanisi, which is very close to Samshulde, around the 15, 20 kilometers. And also the excavations of Damanisi medieval site revealed the mint. And also there is a third archaeological site of Rustavi, where also there was a mint in the same times in the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. So this is what we do know for sure. But for some Samshulde, we just can suppose until we don't have uh, archaeological evidence of this means. So if you are interested in means and in the in records, you can access it in the archives and in the results of these three archaeological site excavations. Yeah, can I ask a second question? Um, the, you mentioned that in the second ord, uh, the, the with the, uh, the copper coins, they were uh, coins that were not from Georgia. Can you comment on their provenance? I don't quite understand. Can uh, you say could again? you repeat your question there? The 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 group of coins that uh, are uh, in copper, 
you presented mostly the Georgian coins, but you mentioned, I think, uh, that some of them were not from Georgia originally. They were probably from a different area. Can you comment yeah. from where they were? Yeah, they are called Il Ilgetizian coins. Ilgetizian coins. And yeah, I didn't I didn't present them here. We do have three of them in this hoard, but they are uh, they are so worn that it's very complicated, very hard to read, or very hard to define what the image them. Only a few letters are survived that our colleagues from the Georgia National Museum could identify as uh, letters that helps us to think they are Ilgetizian coins. Okay. And do you think they are related to trade activities between uh, the Georgia and uh, this particular region? Uh, they, 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 they appeared in the region of Samshulda, yes, after the trade activities. Okay. If, if your question is like that, uh, towards to that, yeah. Trade so do you think it's, it's commercial activity or do you think there is some poll or tax that is paid when the caravan is stopping by uh, uh, the, the castle? Yeah, probably commercial activities. Yeah. Okay. After the commercial activities. Thank you. It's, it's a great talk. Thank you for the question. Uh, the next question here is from Winston Zach, who doesn't have audio. Um, at Semschmilde, uh, are you using metal detectors to locate any of the metal objects, um, such as individual coin finds or coin hoards um, that are found across the promontory? Okay. Uh, we, as a team of archaeologists, of course, are following the methodology, which is the archaeological methodology. And this is this takes a lot of time to do excavations after methodology, but anyway, this is how we work and how we do teach the students to excavate. Uh, our team never use the metal detectors because uh, you know our main goal when when we do excavations is not to find some particular coins or some particular metal objects in uh, in which. Uh, the detectors can be very helpful. Our main goal is to learn all the contexts of the archaeological site, all the layers. And when you do excavations of this context and the layers, sometimes you have a coin, sometimes you have a pottery, sometimes you have a different, different uh, uh, archaeological stuff. Yes, metal detectors can be very helpful when you do maybe let's say when you do a uh, landscape surveys landscape surveys so they help you to uh, just understand what to expect after the excavations but for a real big scale excavations and when you follow the methodologies we do not use these metal detectors and, yeah. uh, and the next question here is from robert hogue if bob if you want to unmute yourself or i can read out the, the next question is to date of the barn layers, yep. right? Okay. Uh, uh, what, what was the, the date of the, uh, the burn layer of a fire in the Royal Palace? And was it reoccupied after that shortly? No, when, when, the, when that palace was burnt, it was not reoccupied after that. And the trench 60, I also shared the image of which to you, it seems that everything what was under the fire was just left on the same place and never occupied. It was occupied only in the 19th century, but not a big scale occupation, only a short, for a short period. The, the date? Regarding, yeah, regarding to the date. You know, we do excavations here for uh, 10 years. And when you do excavations for a continuously and for a long time, you have a good stratigraphy. So you have an understanding what a layer, uh, what the date of the layer or single context is. And particularly when you have very general types of the pottery that is attributed to 11th century or 12th century or 13th century, it helps you to think 
and to make a more precise dates. But when you also, and at the same time, if you have a remains of the architectural, the palace architecture, all the wall buildings, also this is the extra information for making the detail. We also were thinking to make a radiocarbon and a radiocarbon dating for the charcoal, but we never did it because we had the coins, 285 coins, and the inscription of the coins, and on some coins we had a date like Coronicor 450 that we can easily convert to a to a to a centuries and to, to the years. So using this. Uh, information, the inscription, uh, the coins and the um, architectural information and the pottery types and to combine all everything, we do have already very good, uh, very good uh, date for the uh, for the burned layers. It is a 12th, 13th century. So this is very close before Mongolian started appeared in, in visions here. But if you mean uh, if you mean a radiocarbon dating or some other physical or chemical methods, we didn't use in this particular case. But on other side, on other uh, cases, when we where we don't have any coins or such archaeological stuff, so of course we do use this methodology of dating the layers. I had been wondering whether. Uh, it might relate to the uh, the Mongols or any other movement of peoples, but I guess you don't you 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 depend upon the relative dates of the ceramics and the layers rather than an absolute date from a carbon fourteen sample. Uh, as I understood, uh, you were supposing these coins are the late of the Mongols. This no, is what you... no, I'm just wondering if, about the burn layer. If you had a, a precise dating of that, and if it could relate to any known historical activities of the region. Okay, no, these coins are before Mongolians appeared. Before Mongolians appeared. For sure. Yeah. Uh, regarding the uh, irregular shaped coins, do we know why they uh, might be produced in that fashion, and are they the same weights as the regular coins? Yeah, the good, good question. Everyone is asking about the irregular shapes, and I also <laughs> was interested in while I started diving into numismatics, and as I was um, consulted my colleagues, the main the main on these irregular shape coins are the are the letters and are the lawyer. Uh, royal imprints. The main value of this coin is the royal imprint that says either name or either facsimile of the you know, king or the queen, and not the shape or the weight of the coin. Yeah. So if you have something very irregular, uh, similar to the fish or similar to something, but you have an imprint of the king of George the Third or Queen Tamar, you have that you really have a good money. But if you have just a regular shape and you don't have there the imprint of a king or a queen, you know that if you have money, but it's not a so big, big value. Uh, that's that's the, all the questions that we have here online and in person. Anyone else want to ask a question? You're welcome to unmute. Otherwise, thank you so much. This was a fantastic talk. Thank you for your time. And uh, you. this was incredible, great information. And um, we look forward to keeping the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.